you want to introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Colin Hales and I'm a postdoc at the University of Melbourne working in the area of neuroscience or neuroengineering and uh, I'm slowly moving my postdoctoral activities towards the main interest of mine which is artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence in particular. Um, so when did your interest turn to the singularity? Uh, actually, that happened when I first started thinking seriously about AI and I was rummaging around on the web and I found the Extropian online forum and uh, started listening to them and I came across this terminology that seemed to be a great concern to all these people. So that's when I discovered it. So how does your work relate to artificial intelligence um, and the singularity? Well... I can say that um, insofar as my work relates to artificial general intelligence, that if someone eventually identifies a singularity, uh, then my artificial general intelligence work can be described in that context. Now, whether it contributes to, to it or not is not for me to judge, but it seems to be one of the um, key points of a singularity that people talk about. It's not a primary concern to me, though. Well, what then motivates your interest in artificial general intelligence? Well, the original motivation came uh, twofold. Early on, it was that I wanted to create a smart uh, controller for industrial control systems. And it generalised quickly to, um, to become an artificial general intelligence problem. But in overall, I'm just concerned about the future and my kids. Really? That's what it comes down to. Um, I want to, it's a very simple outcome, the Boy Scout outcome. Leave the place in as good or better shape than it was when you got there. And uh, so that's guided me. Um, so the issues that are of concern to me um, are all the big ones. Uh, I've got a list here, ageing, disease, environmental degradation, food production, water supply, climate change, species diversity, transport, security and military space exploration, and there's uh, additional sideline stuff, medical implants for epilepsy, Parkinson's, and perhaps brain-machine interfaces. And there's also a, uh, a brain tissue replacement so that you can replace animals in animal research, which is becoming problematic more and more as time goes on. So all those issues together, there's a lot of them, uh, they've become my focus in my AI work. <clears throat> yeah, and to the extent that the future is altered in those areas, that'll be a measure of my success or otherwise. So. Well, what's your take on the difference between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence? Right, well, the I've come to, I've got two words that, or two phrases that, characterize it as well as I think I can, and that AI is novelty impaired or novelty blinded, and AGI isn't. Um, and that's the major distinction between them. Um, in a functional sense, an AGI will be able to do science like we do, uh, whereas an AI won't. And uh, the characteristics of AI are that it is domain bound and fragile. It doesn't handle novelty very well. And um, uh, the other issue which I'd use to characterize the difference is that generalized learning within a domain is not artificial general intelligence. It's the domain to domain adaptability, which is a characteristic of AGI. So those sort of areas are what I would use to characterize the difference between them. This isn't formalised anywhere, as far as I know. It's still a matter of debate. But in the main, that's it. I guess it, it helps to sort of understand the difference between narrow intelligence and, and intelligence that can cross-populate learning yeah. across domain. But some people are still um, concerned that a lot of uh, what AGI 
is supposed to be able to be doing could be fulfilled by just widening domains of um, narrow intelligence. If that's possible, yeah. Yeah. As you widen the domain, you will encounter novelty to the extent that whatever it is that you built can cope with that novelty, then the intelligence is more general. Um, my idea is that, like us, we have no no obvious domains except maybe space yet so far um, where our domains are limited. No matter where we go, we seem to be able to make do and learn. And uh, insofar as testing is concerned, if you wanted to validate artificial general intelligence, the first thing that I would do is take it out of whatever it's been taught in, put it in a completely new environment and see what happens. That would be the key feature that I would look for. No matter how big that in, that domain you've used is, take it away. Something new. It's interesting to think if um, uh, an AI that it had been either uh, evolutionarily uh, evolved using evolved neural nets or um, some other AI tool to work in one domain, whether that would cross easily cross pollinate into another domain. It's hard to know. Well, in the terms of human development, it appears that there is some some kind of threshold of complexity which was exceeded naturally somewhere once. Uh, and that natural intelligence found itself able to adapt and did with added the added um, complexities of language and, and technology. Um, we were able to adapt to pretty much anywhere, even space. So th that threshold of complexity is something that, again, is is really poorly understood. Um, we'll get better idea about that as we go on. So what motivates your interest in the singularity? Um, mostly because... Uh, the discussions are interesting. Um, the forums and topics and the people are not encumbered by the behaviours of the factory floor of science. And as such, they go places that um, I find stimulating from my own creativity's point of view. And um, I love writing and... Um, they're just good discussions. I mean, there, there is a space cadet element to it, um, but if you pick your targets carefully, you can actually get a lot out of it. Um, some of them, some of the participants are really out there, but they're worth, even they're worth encountering uh, at some level. How would you like to be the Wright brothers being told no one's ever going to fly? You know, I mean, you know, it's a bit of a cliche almost unless you have the uh, rough and tumble of critical argument and a place for expression of new ideas, you know, we're all, you know, doomed pretty much uh, to be trapped by the dogma of the past. So. Is, is our future more like a Harry Potter scenario or a Terminator Skynet <laughs> scenario? Yeah, I get asked this a lot. Um, I reckon it's Harry Potter... But even better, it's Harry Potter without the Voldemort. Uh, in fact, it, our present is actually quite Harry Potter already. Call me um, optimistic, but uh, I see the Terminator outcome as a really daft projection of, of our own stupidity into machines, and I think we can do better than that. So uh, I'm pretty optimistic. So what is it about the Terminator scenario that you think is um, often overestimated or misinformed? Well, the motivation to do anything is mysterious enough. Uh, the motivation to eat, for example. Um, the motivation to have sex, the motivation to drink. To jump straight to the motivation to world domination and, you know, genocide seems... Very odd to me. Why? What's in it for the machines? Uh, I don't get it. Uh, I never understood that. To me, it's an exploration of our worst fears and 
even I'm not even. I think we've explored it well enough. We've had fifty years of of the um, dystopian robot outcome. I think we could probably do better than that. So yeah, Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of what some uh, people, including the Singularity Institute, would suggest is the the machines <laughs> may not hate us but may be completely indifferent to our plight, not having any empathy for us, might be interested in um, repurposing the atmosphere so as to uh, make itself less amenable to rust or repurpose our molecules to give itself more RAM. What are your thoughts? I really think it's, um, it's not particularly helpful to try and second-guess the behaviour of something in the future like that. We just don't know. Um, if the machines have any form of emotional system like us, then, and the, in this, to the extent that I understand the way intelligence works, the, uh, they will be as good or as bad as those examples of goodness and badness are around them. And, uh, I think that they will be empathic in ways that we can't even imagine yet. And that imagining the darker side of that first is really not helpful. Concentrating on it to the, to the exclusion of everything else, again, not helpful. Um, you have to be a bit psychologically analytical about this. Yeah, I mean, we can't just base our assumptions of uh, what an AI might do based on our own biases um, <clears throat> if, if we're not modelling the AI as on ourselves. Well, the question then is, um, you know, can intelligence arise in any other model other than something like ourselves? We don't know that yet. So There are so many things not known that reacting to imagined doom and gloom is... Um, it's unhelpful. Right. Where does Moore's law fit in with your idea on the emergence of a real AGI? Um, in a way, it, it's involved, but not in the way that everyone else thinks it's involved. Um, to me, the increase in, in speed of computing and the memory capacities and so forth are associated with uh, semiconductor fabrication line dimensions, minimum line widths and other fabrication limits that have caused this increase. And insofar as my chips require a very high density three-dimensional structure to them that's facilitated by those tiny line widths, Moore's Law is important because it's really only become possible to do what I want to do in the last 15 years or so. So Moore's Law is indirectly relevant to me, um, but because I continually come across arguments about the capacity of computing uh, as a trigger to AGI, um, uh, I find myself distanced from that idea because my chips don't involve computing. However, the line widths are really important, so it's an indirect effect. So conversely, um, where do your ideas about the emergence of a real AI not fit in with Moore's Law? Uh, Not fit in. Well, it's really to the extent that I'm not using computing, um, there's no, there's no computing on my chip, so well, that discussion is irrelevant to me. Yeah. Well, I guess um, a lot of people like to extrapolate Moore's Law as the answer to, you know, will AI come about? But surely AI isn't just a, a matter of being able to scale up hardware requirements, as you were suggesting before. It, it does come about through the development of new ideas. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I... Um, in my particular instance, I'm basing my project on an analysis of uh, ne- neuroscience and cognition. So um, my approach is to uh, literally replicate 
the physics that's going on in the brain. And that replication does not involve computing a model of anything. It involves assembling the components in, in the same way that you would uh, get the fuel for a fire and make fire. It's the same analogous process. If you wanted to fly, you would put the physics of flight together and fly. You don't compute a model of flight. So that's the approach and uh, that's the reason why Moore's Law is not any kind of trigger except insofar as the fabrication te uh, techniques have improved a lot. Okay, do you think that there is a lower threshold to consciousness? No. <laughs> do I have to elaborate any more than that? <laughs> no. All right, um, every, there are so many theories of consciousness and uh, I, have my, I have my ideas that are consistent with the neuroscience that I'm familiar with, that are the basis for my chips. Um, the quick take home view is that the, the property that, that is, is, uh, used to construct the fully populated, vivid, uh, internal experiences of humans that we call consciousness, uh, is built into the fabric of nature, of, of the natural world at, at all levels. And uh, if, it's, if you have a, a very, 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 very tiny little bit of the natural world, you have a very, very, very little bit of consciousness. And the more, more bits of the natural world that you accrete, the, the bigger the potential for consciousness. But only if it's organized in a certain way. And that organization, we only have one example of, and that's our human brain. How do we effectively communicate the real possibility of AGI becoming a potential risk or opportunity for the Australian community? Mm. Kind of like a um, popularizing or publicizing the ideas of science, but this is specific. Well, I'm going to be boring here and say that we're going to do that the same way we do with any other idea or innovation. Um, if you don't know, say so. Um, you give informed likelihoods rather than specifications and uh, base it all on evidence. I can't add anything more to that. There's nothing special to me about the um, AGI outcome in any more than any other technical innovation. You know, if I was the, the inventor of fossil fuels being asked to speculate about the potential risks of fossil fuel use in the long term, I'd have a similar problem. So, you know, I can't add anything more. Well, what drives public opinion on scientific issues generally? Is this similar to what drives public opinion about AI or AGI? And has public opinion mm. in the past been a moving picture? I am not an expert on the dynamics of public opinion. And that sounds like a, a, you know, a slippery way out, but I'm really not. I find the whole thing mysterious. And I don't think I can add anything, any wisdom to, to the whole scenario. Um, in fact, I would suggest that you talk to our chief scientist, Professor Ian Chubb about that very issue because that's his portfolio. He's the science communicator. He's in charge of uh, identifying risks uh, and getting people to address them publicly. Do you so, think anything like AI or ATI is on his uh, radar? I doubt it. And maybe that is something that could be done. Somewhere way down on his agenda, he may have a little spot there, warmed up and ready. But uh, uh, what it takes to get that spot occupied by AGI, uh, I don't know. Perhaps this, who knows? Interviewing, mm. conferences. Yeah. 
Given that you believe that consciousness arises through a complex interplay of electric fields themselves spawned in part by ion channels floating in the lipid layers of cellular surfaces, do you think, therefore, that cryonics is doomed to fail and that consciousness would be irretrievably lost when these layers are destroyed? Right. Uh, big question. By cryonics, I'm assuming that you mean that um, the life extension cryonics, not general cryonics. Because yeah, we're talking yeah, about, we're talking the about uh, Alcor and the like. Yeah. Um, so the idea that the electromagnetic field of brain material is, is the seat of consciousness is not new. It's been around since the late 80s or early 90s, I think. I've forgotten the name of the original guy. I should know, but I can't recall it just now. Um, but only very recently has the electromagnetic field of the tissue been uh, held accountable for being very critical, a very critical determinant of brain dynamics. So in the moment-to-moment -moment operation of the brain, the electromagnetic fields are influencing things. So in a cryonics context, what you're talking about is that unless you record uh, enough information or unless you can retrieve enough information from the, um, from the remains of the, of the cryogenically preserved individual, unless you rec uh, can retrieve enough information to restore the fields as well, then the resultant entity, whatever that is that it's reinvigorated afterwards, will not be anything like what the original was. Furthermore, I would hold that it wouldn't actually work at all because unless you use a substrate that physically recreated the electromagnetic fields. If you take the electromagnetic fields of the kind produced by a brain out of the picture and replace them with something else, the arbitrary machinations of a computer substrate, then the consciousness is gone. And so whatever it is that comes back won't be conscious. It'll be, I don't know what it'll be. So there's a double whammy there. You have to first retrieve sufficient information to recreate the dynamics of the electromagnetic field and all the other connectivity, all the network connectivity to do with synapses and so forth. And then you have to put it into a substrate which generated both the normal action potential signaling and the electromagnetic field signaling. If you did that uh, in sufficient detail, then I, I would say that you could actually bring someone back. But that possibility is uh, somewhat in the future, to put it mildly. Um, uh, I'm working on that substrate, but the substrate that I produce will be a very, very small... Um, cut down version of what goes on in a brain and it will be some time before we're knowledgeable enough to build one sufficiently complex uh, and have the manufacturing capability to make something that could reproduce an actual piece of tissue with enough detail. So insofar as cryogenics and life restoration is concerned, dim, dim in the future, but possible if you use the right substrate. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, a highly intelligent thing can't be created with a slightly different version of what's going on in the brain. It's just that it's not quite the same as what's in the brain, but it has all the basic properties of the brain. And that's my primary objective in my work. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think, think it, it does. does. Um, I guess... Uh, would you like to explain um, what these electromagnetic signals are and, and maybe explain how EFAPSIS works? EFAPSIS. Um, the brain creates an elaborate electromagnetic field system. And if you can think of it as a, um, a series of membranes being plucked elaborately, ping, 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 by neurons, and that from the, that is a characterization of the uh, electromagnetic field system. And all of the superimposed wave propagations all over that membrane 
collectively add up to us to being a single unified entity and that that entity is literally delivering the, our first person perspective to us at least that's the model that I'm working on and uh, you can treat those membranes as, as a kind of um, blank palette upon which you can paint with a palette of experiences the suite of, of uh, various types of experiences that we get into a single unified structure. Um, painting from a palette of experiences onto a, the external world as a, as a blank uh, canvas is the idea that conveys the way the electromagnetic field operates in our brain. And I've figured out um, what, what the brushes are and where the paint comes from, but I can't tell you what color the paint is at the moment. So I don't understand that well enough. But the process is pretty easy to see in the operation of ion channels in, um, in term, insofar as Ephapsis is concerned, it's a term which is debatable, but the fields expressed by one neuron can influence the operation of an adjacent neuron. And when it does that, that's Ephapsis. And it does that in the normal way of electromagnetism, just standard physics, classical physics, nothing special. And um, it seems to prime um, that or the neighbouring neuron for an action potential. Yeah, if, if a neighbouring neuron is near firing, it's hypersensitized to very small changes, about one part in a million or more, less, sorry, uh, of the field will cause it to the timing of that firing to be advanced or retarded and thereby change the dynamics of the local group of neurons and thereby th throughout the material. But at the same time as it's doing that, it's, it's painting on that blank canvas in space. That's the, you have to think of this as a spatial effect. We're imprinting our fields on space. And in effect, the space itself is the, is the uh, version of the canvas that's being painted. And unless you paint, you have no experience. So on the palette of colors for the experiences, you have the usual colors, but you also have sadness and disgust and uh, happiness and hunger and orgasm and so forth. It's an unusual palette. The physics of this I'll be um, bringing out in publications in the not too distant future. It's not that hard. Um, the electromagnetic field system of brain material has been um, thought to be, or was one of the possibilities for the seat of consciousness for a very long time, over 20 years. And uh, it's only in the last two years that it's been proved to be causally active in brain dynamics. And so my idea would be that the, um, the cryogenics, the restoration of a human after cryogenics would require two things. Firstly, that you'd have to get all the information out of the remaining tissue to allow a new substrate that can do both action potentials and the electromagnetic fields. And if you do that, then restoration is possible. But if you leave either of those out, game over. That would be my view. I'm building the substrate, a, a version of the substrate that will allow both. But if you just think you're going to create a model in a computer, uh, the field system of the computer is not the field system of a brain, and therefore it will be unconscious. And I don't know what it will be, but the original person is gone. Do you think that by building incredibly intelligent machines, we can solve environmental problems? And what will these machines help solve um, other issues like uh, cleaning up rejuvenation of an environmental damage? Will it be able to help solve game theory problems and political problems that we have? Uh... I'd, uh, I'd tend to... The answer, quick answer is yes, that the machines can do that, but with, they don't have to be incredibly intelligent. They can learn like us, but they don't have to be incredibly intelligent to assist us. Um, a swarm of 
intelligent mice that respond to verbal commands run by a shepherd could probably achieve a lot in a farm, for example. And those critters, those small creature AGIs, will be able to, if they can adapt to novelty like the way in the way that I am planning, will be the kind, that's where I see AGI actually happening first. It doesn't have to be super intelligent. Um, that, that would be my slant on that. So yes, you can, we can have a dramatic impact on all sorts of areas in the environment, food production, disease, uh, and aging, that kind of thing. But we don't need incredibly intelligent machines to do that. We just need generally intelligent, small robots. Could we benefit or perhaps even need smarter minds than human have as to solve some of the existential threats we've been facing? Um, if we had smarter minds than humans, then they could be applied to those kinds of um, big picture problems. But I don't actually see that we ne the necessity for that at this stage. We've got ever ever growing capacity for uh, the uh, data mining on a huge scale. For example, Watson was an example of that. And our problems are really a lot of our problems are to do with um, data integrity and an ability to data mine properly. And when that's when that's orchestrated, I think we can solve all sorts of problems without having to have some large-scale, greater-than-human intelligence. Um, and that would be a form of um, human collective intelligence rather than a single-minded AGI doing the same thing. So I, I actually don't see the necessity at this stage. Perhaps there will be celestially-sized problems in the future that might need a really uh, super-huge um, ability to correlate all sorts of things. But at this stage, I... I I don't see we can do pretty well with what we've got. So. A possible implication of building ATI or similar technology is the emergence of societies which are much with a much smaller proportion of jobs available to people than is currently the case. Given the existing social rhetoric around the idea that jobs give meaning to life. Do you anticipate that significant resistance to AGI technologies could come from those who fear losing their jobs? Um, I have had an entire career in the automation industry, and I've literally witnessed the impact of automation over the last 30 years. And I'm 56 at the moment, and... What I literally saw in the factories was, was change. Right? I saw a fewer people doing different jobs in the same factory that was then more productive. Uh, I saw jo jobs change. Um, I saw temporary dislocation, which was then adapted to. People moved, people retrained, uh, reskilled or people just left and retired. And that and I've seen sites all over the world and in lots in Australia. And I don't see this challenge as any different. Well there will be dislocations, uh, but there will be changes in ways that we just can't possibly imagine and we will adapt in the same way that I've seen for the last thirty years. Um, I you can get fearful about major dislocation, but I, I see the, the things that were left in the factories, the remnant jobs were very different than the ones that were there in the first place. And uh, I see the same thing happening. I'm going to hear, I'm going to predict the resurgence of the shepherd as a, as a vocation. All right. That would be a viable, you know, somebody who's got a, uh, a herd of small creature AI that can be contracted to perform certain duties and act as a nucleus of activity and instruction is a shepherd with a bunch of very smart sheep. And, uh, 
there's a change. There are no shepherds, or not many anyway, in the world at the moment. But I think there will be more in the future, and not less. So look, I have no idea, I, and speculating on how, how the impact is is too hard. What I know is my own experience tells me that we will adapt to it, and that it's not worth panicking over at this stage. What will people do? Um, well, I mean, we we look at cottage industries and how they sort of gave way to industrialization and centralization of jobs in the factories that you mentioned um but what we're replacing generally in a roundabout way is physical labor to an extent we were, we were replacing muscle um mm -hmm. but now with a lot of the the data mining the the business intelligence the um decision support systems we're actually replacing intelligence we're offloading even more of our intelligence onto the environment more than we did with just books and language and and stockpiling culture mm -hmm. so do you think actually you know the idea that we can create agents in the environment maybe not necessarily conscious or self-aware but agents that can help make decisions and make decisions for mm -hmm. us um a destabilizing phenomenon the destabilizing phenomenon. Oh, I don't know whether it could be stabilizing or destabilizing. I couldn't even hazard a guess about that. It's not knowable at this stage. I can see ways that, that I would really like to have uh, some kind of soft agent that could go out and find the best price for X for me without me having to harass lots of people um, but uh, I really don't know I the, the future that's coming is is uh, sufficiently um, unpredictable that uh, it, it's not worth worrying about it just that we have to be aware that change is coming and adapt to it that's my main message really how do we adapt to change if we can't predict it same way we always have <laughs> that's the answer to my question you know, basically the, the answer to this question is that, that the way we behave is the same way we've always behaved in the face of change but the face of change is different yep that's right and that's the part of our human condition you know our domain is expanding and we are able to adapt so that's i just see it as being more of more of the same but the same is a lot more difference. You know, we've encountered change all down the line. So look at things like Facebook, you know, unimaginable even less than 10 years ago, the impact of it. Uh, unpredictable change, lots of adaptation, a process which is dynamic day to day. Facebook went public yesterday or the day before. Big change, you know. Same thing. Consider the view that part of what makes us creative and innovative is not just a possession of human brain, but really one of a large continuum of possible minds that make this possible. We seem to have a kind of strong pre-existing personal attachments to the anthropocentric ideal of human mind and agency, and it's always been on top of the intellectual pyramid. You can reference a lot of movies and literature that um, portray this archetype. Are you concerned that AI or AGI technologies may result in a world where humans are no longer regarded as the primary engines of innovation creation? I think the answer to that is no. That's probably not, that's insufficient. Um, at the moment, the great majority of people are not the engines of creation, creativity and innovation. In the future, I see that majority of uninvolved reducing. I see it as actually an increase for the great majority or for the, the bulk of people will have more than they ever have. And the confinement of the, the major innovation and creativity to specialized little niches that right up 
one end of the sigma curve, uh, or the Gaussian, I see that as, uh, as changing. I actually see there'd be more power at the fingertips of, of people than ever before. And they won't be, uh, confined to a, a job in the way that they once were. Um, so there's my optimism sneaking in again there. <laughs>